apresentando Design for Hackability, com vocês, Catarina Mota. Hi, uh, it's great to be here. So I am going to talk about designing objects to enable appropriation and transformation by users and what challenges and opportunities this presents. But first, let me tell you a little bit more about where I'm coming from and why I'm so interested in this topic. So I'm a social sciences scholar. I have no formal training in engineering nor design. But I'm also a hardware hacker. Not the kind that breaks into your computer to steal your information, but the kind that is curious about how things work, what they do, why they do what they do, and what else they can do. So hackers love to open devices, to make them do new things, and even to build machines from scratch. Instead of accepting the world as it is presented to us, hackers want to explore the world and participate in its construction. One characteristic of hackers is that many of us believe that it's important to share information about the makeup of technologies. It's this information that allows us to understand how they work and to appropriate them and transform them, to make them do what we want them to do. This is called open source hardware, which is the research and development method in which designers make publicly available all the information necessary to reproduce, modify, and uh, copy um, a piece of technology. So I'd like to show you a video that we made last year to explain how open source hardware works and why we find it important. What is open source hardware? It's a physical item whose source files have been shared openly with the world and can be freely copied or modified. In the open world, it's not about reinventing the wheel. Anyone can improve and build upon the ideas of those around them, and innovation is accelerated through the open exchange of ideas. Rather than starting from scratch, open source hardware allows you to modify a design for your own project or even turn it into a business. In 1817, a two-wheeled machine called a Draisine was invented. It was made entirely of wood, propelled by walking, and designed to ease travel across the Royal Gardens. But because people saw hundreds of ways to make that machine work for them, over the past 200 years, they modified the prototype, adding useful things like pedals, rubber tires, gears, chains, and durable metal frames. Over time, our international community took a simple machine's original design, shared their ideas, and customized the modern bicycle to suit the needs of 1.4 billion people around the world. This collaboration is what the open source movement is all about, and its ideology has the potential to shape the future of how our society does business. In a world fueled by open contribution, companies can no longer rest on intellectual property. This allows the open source hardware world to quickly find the most efficient and fastest producers for physical goods. On a level playing field strengthened by community input, companies will be distinguished by their adaptability and the quality of their products. By opening progress to the public, we put the catalyst for positive change in the hands of those who care about it most, and we can begin to see innovation driven by passion and equality. So today, most of us are used to customizing digital products. It's just something that we do. But hacking physical products is not as easily done, because atoms are not as easily manipulated as bits. However, this line between digital and physical is starting to get increasingly blurrier. And this is in part due to machines called digital fabrication tools, which transform digital designs into physical objects. You can see on this picture one of those machines, a 3D printer, and now I'd like to show you a 3D printer in action just because it's fun.
So laser cutters are another type of digital fabrication tool, except that instead of building an object out of plastic layer by layer, they cut flat stock material, such as wood, paper, and uh, acrylic, for example. In this video, this laser cutter is cutting a little uh, dollhouse out of wood. Now, you can probably imagine the implications of these technologies and the ways they can bring into the physical world the creative processes that are now so common in the digital world. One of the first people to grasp the transformative potential of these technologies was Professor Neil Gershenfeld. So I want to show you a video in which he talks about Fab Labs, which are community workshops where people can come to use these kinds of tools. We've had a digital revolution, but we don't need to keep having it. We can declare success, we won. What's coming now is the digital revolution in fabrication. My colleagues and I started teaching a class called How to Make Almost Anything. And the idea was just that. It's a program looking at how the digital world relates to the physical world. And one of the core things coming out of the research is the idea of digital fabrication, making the Star Trek replicator an assembler that makes anything you want by building the atoms on up. This is designed where you put in the millions of dollars of equipment at MIT are like the mainframes of digital fabrication. We can make anything we want using those tools. In 20 years, we'll make it so you can have it in the home. The fab labs are in between. They spread all around the world, letting ordinary people create technology from South Africa to the north of Norway and from rural India to inner city Boston. Instead of spending vast amounts of money to send computers and energy and communication around the world, you can spend much less to send the means to create it. Energy, communication, computation, just to say the words, they sound big. They're being tackled as billion dollar mega projects top down. Fab Labs is tackling them from the bottom up. We're just finding so many people with such interesting inventions and such great ideas. Sharing that is where I see this going. Now, even more interesting and transformative than the machines themselves is the fact that they are now accessible to all of us. And this is happening in three different ways, or three interrelated ways. So one of them is through public factories, such as fab labs and tech shops, which are basically facilities equipped with a vast array of equipment and with people there who can help you to use, learn how to use these machines and design what you want to design. And basically, fab labs usually are free. You can just walk in um, and have your object fabricator, and tech shops work pretty much like a, a gym where you pay a monthly membership and you get to go there any time to do whatever you want and you still have assistance doing it. Another way in which we can now have access to these kinds of machines is through online digital fabrication services such as Shapeways and Punoco. And these are basically online factories and the way they work is you go on one of these websites, you submit a CAD design, um, whatever a model for whatever you want to have laser cut or 3D printed, they do it on one of their facilities and then send it to you in the mail. And then the third way in which we now have access to these tools is by actually acquiring them. So 3D printers, laser cutters, and CNC mills are getting cheap enough that we can actually have one in the home or in the office. And even if we can't afford one ourselves, there are many collectives that are people who are getting together to acquire one of these machines and share it. So the increasing distribution of these technologies means that the future of designing and making objects can be very, very different from what it is today. Uh, and now I'd like to show you one of my favorite short animation films, which uh, is called uh, Full Printed by Nueve Ojos, which imagines what the future of manufacturing might be like based on these technologies.
last cup design. Yeah. Down now. Chair. Upload. Save jitters. So in the famous words of William Gibson, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. So many designers are already experimenting with what design might look like in a future in which everyone has access to fabrication tools. And I'd like to show you some interesting projects that tackle this challenge. The first one is a project by Diatome Studio called Sketch Chair. Hi, I'm Tiago Rook. And I'm Greg Salt. And we're sitting on sketch chairs. So these have come from a program that we've developed, an open source tool that allows anybody to design, build, and share their own furniture. So sketch chairs are designed using a simple sketch face in space that then generates the chairs and allows you to virtually sit in them, testing their stability to see if they're going to fall over they're going to break, and also to make sure that the chair fits your proportions so it's just the right size for you. Files from a sketch chair are then sent through to a CNC milling machine, which cuts the parts from plywood, like in these examples here. And uh, these, then it's a simple matter of slotting these parts together. So you can get your own sketch chair through an online digital fabrication service who will cut those chairs out for you and then ship the parts out to you as a simple, lightweight, flat package. And so, we plan that users and designers alike will be able to upload their sketch chairs that they design to the sketch chair website. And then this means that you can go to this website and you can download other people's chairs and you can build on them, you can customise them to make that perfect fit with your body. And in this way, you don't have to start a chair from scratch. You 
can take other people's chairs and modify them. It's kind of like a giant open source idea store full of customizable furniture in some ways. Mm. So we see the process, the role of the designer and the user changing. We think that more and more the user will be contributing, will be enriching the products that they buy and customizing them. And that designers will be designing products with users through systems that they make. So the products people will be buying will be designed as a collaboration almost between the person buying the product and the designer that's designed the system. Another very interesting project along the same lines is WikiHouse, which is a house, an open source house construction set that can be fabricated with laser cutters or CNC mills. So we're now seeing the beginning of what's been called the third industrial revolution, driven by the web and also by ever and ever cheaper access to digital fabrication tools like 3D printers and CNC machines. So where our present industrial economy is that we design things in the West, send the blueprints halfway around the world to be manufactured in a sweatshop for cheap, cheap labour costs, and then ship them all the, way, the products all the way back again. We're moving into a future where the factory is potentially everywhere. Where if you want something, you no longer necessarily have to buy it, you can actually download it, adapt it, and print it at home or in your community. As the economist John Maynard Keynes said, it's easier to ship recipes than cakes and biscuits. Obviously, like all industrial revolutions, that's hugely disruptive, socially, economically, and politically. Suddenly, your recipes, your intellectual property, become simultaneously the most valuable thing in the world, but also, paradoxically, they want to be free and open and shared. Um, if the factory is everywhere, the design team is every one. Um, one size no longer fits all. It gives us the opportunity to do for design what Wikipedia does for knowledge, what Linux does for software, to open it up. And we were fascinated by what that might mean for architecture and cities. At its core, WikiHouse is a community library of 3D models, uh, which are shared under a Creative Commons license, and they have a common set of design principles and a common set of design standards. And the aim is to make it possible for anybody to take one of those files and download them. And uh, at the moment we use SketchUp because it's free and it's dead easy to use. And they can use the WikiHouse plugin from that model uh, and those files and that information to generate a set of cutting files uh, from which you can effectively print out a kit of parts um, using a conventional sheet material uh, like uh, structural plywood. And those parts are assembled not unlike a very large IKEA model. Uh, it can be done very simply without the need for traditional construction skills or power tools. Um, it's done using wedge and peg connections, um, using mallets which themselves are part of the printed kit. And then the lightweight frames are lifted into place, not unlike the traditional barn raising. And uh, a team of two or three people um, can complete a small house structure in about a day. And what you end up with is the basic chassis of a house, onto which can then be applied uh, things like windows or wiring services, um, insulation and skin, uh, either generic or local solutions with materials you have available, or themselves, uh, those could be quite open digitally manufactured items. And of course the house you end up with isn't a static product, it's a kind of factory. It has the capability within itself to make new parts for itself or even to make other houses. So we can begin to see the ghost of a fully open urban development model. That's a way off. We're still in the early stages of experimenting. A few prototypes have been built around the world and the amazing thing is that there are now a community of teams um, all over the place who have begun to take the system, adapt it, tinker with it and improve it slightly, from Yorkshire to Christchurch in New Zealand. And we're supporting setting one up in one of Rio's favelas. WikiHouse is only a small answer, but it's a bloody huge question. Globally right now, the fastest growing cities aren't skyscraper cities, they're favelas, self-made cities. 
So if we're serious about tackling issues like climate change, urbanisation, global health, then architecture's traditional business model isn't going to do it because it's beyond the reach of 98 or 99% of the world's population. As Robert Neuwirth says, there isn't a state or a bank or a developer or an aid agency who's going to be able to do it if we're all just treated as consumers. What we need to be doing is building tools and infrastructure for the social economy, which is the long tail of people who build one house for themselves, to make it radically easier to produce healthy, sustainable buildings, even without professionals. Imagine if we, as a society, can develop low-cost, effective, scalable, adaptable, open-source solutions, not just to the problem of structure, but to things like sanitation, off-grid energy. The development of sort of 21st century vernaculars and share them as part of a kind of democratic, democratic commons. And once they're there, they'll be there forever. So if you're a designer, an architect, a software developer, a backer, you know, come and be part of the world's biggest design team. The Global Village Construction Set is another excellent example of this new approach to industrial design. The GVCS is a set of 50 open source industrial machines being developed by an organization called Open Source Ecology with a goal of providing production capabilities to everyone. To achieve this, the GVCS tools are inspired by the concept of Erector Set, which you can see represented on the image on the left. That is, they draw from a limited number of parts and shapes from which a, great, a greater number of things can be built. The set is also highly modular. For example, instead of using one engine for each of the 50 machines, the entire set relies on a single power unit design that can be coupled to every one of the other 49 machines. And now I would like to look at uh, modularity applied to phone design. So we're going from industri houses, industrial machines, and now little things like phones. Every day we throw away millions of electronic devices because they get old and become worn out. But usually it's only one of the components that causes the problem. The rest of the device works fine but is needlessly thrown away. Simply because electronic devices are not designed to last. This makes electronic waste one of the fastest growing waste streams in the world. And our phone is one of the biggest causes. So this is a new kind of phone. It's made of blocks. Detachable blocks. They are all connected to the base. And the base connects everything together. Electrical signals are transferred through the pins. And two small screws lock everything in place. So if, for instance, your phone is getting a little slow, you could just upgrade the block that affects the speed. Or if something breaks, you can easily replace it with a new one, or update it with the latest version. Another great thing about this is, you can customise your phone. So let's say this is your phone, and you do everything in the cloud. Why not replace your storage block for a bigger battery block? If you're like this guy and love to take pictures, why not upgrade your camera? Or if you don't care about any of this stuff, you can keep it simple, and get a bigger speaker. You can choose the blocks you want, support the brands you like, or even develop your own blocks. Phone Blocks is built upon an open platform where companies work together to create the best phone in the world. The last project I would like to show you is Little Bits, which is a library of electronic building blocks from which many different things can be created.
So far, I've been talking mostly about technology because that's the area I work in. But hacking applies to all sorts of things. Some of you may be familiar with a practice called IKEA hacking. So IKEA hacking is the modification and repurposing of IKEA products. And it's a lot more common than you'd think. Um, let me show you some of my favorite examples. On this one, someone took a bunch of IKEA stools, and instead of using them to sit on, he sawed them in half and used them to make bookshelves. On this other one, a bunch of IKEA vases were used to make a bathroom wall. So those units you see on the photo, they're not bricks, they're actually flower vases that were stacked. And here, a couple IKEA chairs were cut, attached to the wall, and are now used to hang clothes on. And on this last one, which is one of my favorites, uh, two salad bowls were used to make an audio speaker. Another very interesting aspect about IKEA hacking is that many of these hackers are also sharing information about how to reproduce their hacks. And some of them are even using IKEA's own instructions language to do this. So they're not just hacking the products, they're also modifying and repurposing other aspects associated with the products. But now comes the bigger question. Why are people hacking specifically IKEA, prod IKEA products? What is it about these products that invites hackability? So two researchers from UC Berkeley asked these same questions. And they found that part of the answer lies in the fact that IKEA products are cheap and can be acquired pretty much anywhere in the world. But there's more to it. So to begin with, the act of shopping IKEA requires embracing the do-it-yourself spirit. Instead of just grabbing a product and heading for the cashier, at IKEA you have to go through these huge warehouses and pick up all the different parts that go into your product. And then when you get home, you have to assemble it yourself. This means that IKEA, people shopping at IKEA are probably already in a more do-it-yourself mindset than when shopping at other venues. The low cost of IKEA products also makes them a more likely target for personalization. While most people hesitate to experiment on a very expensive piece of furniture, low-cost products lower the risk of failure, meaning if you don't like the result, at least you didn't ruin something that would be very expensive to replace. Another thing that the UC Berkeley researchers found out is that the spare, sleek design of IKEA products is used by hackers as a blank canvas. So the simplicity of these designs leaves enough room for users to actually make their own imprint, to leave their own mark. Finally, the modularity of these designs also allows for reconfiguration. While a non-modular design can ha only have one shape, the modularity of many IKEA products allows for experimentation with combination and recombination. But what does IKEA hacking mean? I mean, why am I talking about this? Why is this interesting? Well, I, what's interesting to me is that IKEA hackers challenge the standardization of products by turning them into the raw materials of creative processes. So the ubiquity of IKEA products is an interesting symbol for a world in which everyone's objects look exactly like everyone else's. So it's very interesting that these hackers are turning this upside down by transforming mass-produced projects, mass-produced products into expressions of individuality and symbols of mastery over the consumer marketplace. So now, what exactly is hackability? I'm not referring to customization here, at least not in the sense in which that word is commonly used nowadays being able to choose the color of your car seats or the RAM for your computer, however great those options might be, do not, in my opinion, consist in hackability. The hackability of an object is the degree to which that object enables and encourages users to modify it, to appropriate it. And there are several strategies for achieving this. One possible approach is to design for end-user manufacturing. So instead of providing a fully finished and assembled device, Products, uh, designers can provide users with digital designs which they can then manufacture themselves. Although this can simply mean providing a CAD model, uh, hackability is usually better served by parametric designs that allow users to get exactly what they want by just changing a few parameters. 
However, in order for this to succeed, it's necessary that designs be fabricable with accessible tools, with tools accessible to users. So a design that requires industrial machinery is obviously not appropriate for end-user manufacturing. Another approach is to design sets of possibilities. So Lego is an excellent example of this. Instead of providing customers with little plastic houses or little plastic trucks, it provides them with building blocks with standardized interfaces and a pattern language that allows them to build the little houses and the little trucks, but also a vast range of other objects. There are also strategies for incorporating hackability into more traditional product design approaches by designing for access and learning. This can be achieved, for example, by pro distributing products in the form of kits instead of fully assembled. So while fully assembled products don't have much flexibility or don't offer that much room for creativity, while assembling a kit, users can actually insert slight modifications in the process. So, um, sorry, okay, so enabling hackability of products also requires creating easy to open devices. So in the first half of the 20th century, it was very common for users to tinker with the engines of their cars or with their radio receivers. But nowadays, users are often discouraged from even looking inside the devices. So much so that many companies have begun using tamper-proof mechanisms, things such as odd-shaped screws which cannot be opened with regular screwdrivers in order to discourage users from opening them. So in order to enable product hacking, designers must pay attention to the access and configuration of mechanisms. The main requirements for making devices hackable were, ca were captured by Mr. Jalopy on the owner's manifesto you see pictured here, in which he calls for easy to open and close cases, replaceable components, and easy to repair designs, among several other things. So now that we covered the what and the how, it's time to address the big question. Why design for hackability? Why is this important? I mean, there are several reasons why I find this actually very important. The first one is of a practical nature. Hackability allows users to get exactly what they want. So designers know just how hard it is to guess what, how users will want to use a, a product and what they'll want to use it for. There were so many talks about this here at this conference yesterday and today. Users, on the other hand, know exactly what they want, but can't always get it. So by allowing them to hack products, designers actually enable users to get exactly what they want and don't even need to know what that is from the get-go. Now, even if designers knew exactly what each and every user of their product wants, it would still be almost impossible to accommodate everyone's needs and desires into a single design. So for this reason, many products are designed to cater to the needs of the majority, but not the minority. So once again, allowing users to hack their products enables them to cover these niche needs without direct intervention from designers and manufacturers. This enables more inclusive products that reflect a wider range of needs and personal preferences. Product hacking can also lead to an expansion of the applications of a product. The Connect is an excellent example of this. So the Connect was launched by Microsoft as a hands-free uh, game device or hands-free game control. I'm sorry, I'm not a gamer, so I get the terminology mixed up sometimes. Um, so it's a really, really awesome device that can actually sense presence and motion in 3D space. Shortly after the launch, and a company named Adafruit, which has close ties to the open source and hacker communities, offered the rewards to the first person to hack the Kinect software and to make it do something else. So soon, Kinect hacks began pouring from all over the world. In the hands of users, Kinect devices began being used as 3D scanners, as navigational systems for robots, and even to assist doctors in surgeries. So, because of all this user experimentation, people realized that the Kinect was useful for a lot more than just gaming. Allowing users to hack products can also help improve the products themselves. One example of this are Linksys routers, which run open source software. 
Because this software is publicly available, many Linksys users actually invested their own time into improving the router software for their own uh, use. In turn, the manufacturers of Linksys were able to take these user-created improvements and fold them back into the next revisions of the device. So this is a case in which users greatly contributing, contributed to actually making a product better. It's also important to note that devices designed for hackability tend to also be more easily repaired. As we saw with the phone blocks example, modular designs allow faulty components to be replaced instead of just throwing away the entire device as we normally do. So I don't, obviously I don't need to tell you how important it is for the environment that we curb this kind of waste. And finally, we must consider the psychological effects. In addition to the IKEA hacking study that I mentioned before, IKEA products were also used on another study conducted by a group of North American researchers. So this research departed from the question of whether people would be willing to pay more for a product they had assembled themselves. So the researchers then set up a series of experiments in which participants were asked to assemble IKEA boxes and then assign them a monetary value. And what this study revealed was that, was that people indeed place a higher value on and are willing to pay more for a product that they assemble themselves. So the research project concluded that love, la <clears throat> excuse me, labor leads to love meaning users tend to form special attachment with attachments with objects that include their own labor. So now, as a researcher and a hacker, my life is formed around questions. I'm constantly asking questions, and usually those questions are, why is this so? Why isn't it some other way? So again, I had to ask, why do people form these special attachments with objects that include their own labor? There is a widely accepted theory in psychology called the self-determination theory. And amongst other things, the theory contends that there are three universal human needs, needs that are present in every human being across all cultures. The first one is the need for competence, the need to control outcomes, to effect changes in the environment, and to experience mastery. This ties really well with the IKEA um, effect case because what the researchers also found out was that only users who actually finished assembling the box developed that special relationship with it. The ones who did not finish, think we lost, oh, we got, okay. The ones who did not finish assembling the box did not create the special relationship. So it's this need that we have to, to act, to do things, and to do them well, to experience that satisfaction from doing something well. The second one is the need for relatedness, the need to be connected with one another, to give but also, to, to receive but also to give. And this is again present in several of the examples we talked about today. For example, the IKEA hackers are not satisfied with just hacking their furniture and leaving it at that. No, they take pictures, they post them online, they post instructions, they read comments, they give each other comments. So. This, hack, this, this process of hacking is very much a social process. It's very much a shared experience that also serves to satisfy this need for relatedness, for connectedness. The third one, and um, possibly the most influential or the most important one, is autonomy. The need to be the causal agents of one's own life. And as we all know, this, is not, this would not be a good way to describe our relationship with objects and technology nowadays. We, we have a relationship of dependence with almost everything we consume. With almost everything we consume, we need designers to design products for us, we need manufacturers to manufacture products for us, and we need distributors to make them available to us. So this act of hacking something, of making something different, serves to satisfy this need to create, to not just consume. So to summarize, hacking is not only offers practical advantages, but it also changes our relationship with objects and our relationships with each other. It changes our pers perspective, our understanding of ourselves and our place in the world. We are not just consumers of other people's creativity. We are creators in our own right, and we are makers of differences. And I would like to end in this note. Also, my time is up, but I think we have some time for questions.